Good afternoon. So um, I'm Mira Hamid. I'm chief of search pad at MSKCC. Some of you know me, some of you don't know me. Um, I've always felt alumni meeting was one of the kind of dearest to heart meetings for, for myself and uh, all our, our faculty. I have been here as a alumni for many years. I've come to this meeting and the last few years I'm hosting part of the alumni um, meeting and it's always nostalgic and wonderful to meet, um, see everybody and how they do. And, uh, and also hear this uh, very legendary talks about not just pathology, um, about I would say life itself and some reflection of what we do as, as doctors as we heard in the morning. So afternoon session will only be about the good people, as we already saw in the morning. <laughs> the center, Dr. Stewart is in the center, and everybody around are, are our good people. So we'll have eight cases, um, and uh, we'll start with the first case. Uh, without wasting time, I'll start, because I'm sure every case is at least 20 minutes. And they're all very interesting and a potpourri of many different entities, which is really all pathology is about. So, so this is what we enjoy about uh, our alumni afternoon. So the first case is uh, going to be presented by Dr. Hikmat Alamari. Hikmat actually came to Memorial, myself and Hikmat came the same year. Um, he is uh, assistant attending um, a G of the GU team uh, now is a leader of the urothelial pathology and neoplasia, not only in morphology, but also um, in the molecular aspects of the disease. So. Okay. Uh, good afternoon and welcome back everyone. And congratulations Dr. Robin for, for the award. Uh, so we'll start off with this case, uh, even though Mira introduced me as doing the, in the GU service, this case is going to have an element of breast cancer, but I'll, well, I'm going to show you hopefully that the similarities or why this is relevant in, uh, in this uh, context. So the history that you received and the, uh, the slides that you, uh, you also received uh, is about a 77-year-old uh, woman who ref was referred to, uh, to Memorial to us with the, with the diagnosis of metastatic globular carcinoma to the bladder. And this is how we get to know about the case. And, and handle it. In this case, actually, I give credit to Dr. Vallejo, who start, received that case and, and started the workup, and we, we all kind of discussed it and had co some consultation and some work done on this case. So some of the relevant history items in this patient. Uh, prior to her presentation, the only thing that was relevant is a 2009 um, uh, mammogram that was normal, but her true, true complaint started actually in July 2005 when she started having increased frequency and a typical uh, a scenario, she goes to the, to the doctor, she, they suspected a UTI, she was treated, did not improve, and then the symptoms continued and she developed incontinence. That's when she w was referred to a urologist, they did a cystoscopy and performed a TUR, and they found a, a malignant a neoplasm that was with the diagnosis as, as mentioned, bully differentiated carcinoma in the submucosa and muscularis probably of the bladder with features suggestive of mammary GYN or upper GI origin. So clearly they were struggling with the with this, how this case looked like. And I'm going to share the slides with you on, on the next slide. Uh, additional workup, different imaging uh, uh, approaches, CT scan, but CT, they all showed similar findings and that was centered around increased some activity in the breast, particularly in the right. There were thickened bladder wall and diffuse uptake and infiltration with extension into the abdominal wall. Whatever the process was, it was deemed to be extensive, locally extensive. She also had bilateral hydronephrosis, which was worse on the right side. They did mammogram. They found dense breast and an asymmetry in the right breast, which was biopsied. Uh, so these are the two uh, organs that were biopsied and we reviewed. The, the, the top one is, is what uh, the result of the first UR. As you can see, this is a, a poorly differentiated carcinoma with diffuse infiltration of individual uh, cells. And the workup was positive for CK7, GATA3, CAA, not the most helpful in differentiating between the breast and bladder. And and the other negative markers are listed here. Uh, and they acknowledge in their report that despite that these breast more like breast specific markers were negative in this case, they were swayed by the focal ER positivity and they favored a mammary origin of this carcinoma. The breast biopsy was performed later when they discovered the densities in the breast and 
and its typical uh, morphology of an invasive lobular carcinoma that was associated also with LCIS. And, um, and they, they, they refer to it as identical to the tumor in the bladder for, again, good, re good morphologic reasons. And, but the difference was ER was strongly positive in the breast primary. So, so this is the, the, the two main tumors that this patient have. And again, uh, we've obviously we did not necessarily agree 100% with the diagnosis, otherwise we would not be presenting this case here. Uh, so, but this, what this case shows actually is a, a, a dilemma that dealing with certain cases of this morphology or this, of these features might present. So you have two tumors in two different organs. One of them, you'll, it's rare to find a tumor with this morphology, although it can happen. And another organ is more likely to have a tumor with this morphology. So our conventional wisdom would say that these tumors would have to be the same and the site of common site origin would be the primary site. And that's why this case was seen as metastatic lobular carcinoma to the bladder. But can we have the, the exception here? So that's the conventional wisdom. Can we have the exception, which all of you probably remember being at Memorial Fellowship, exception is actually what Memorial does. So, so is there a, a, a room that this could, there could be two primary tumors that are identical in morphology uh, happening at the same time in the same patient? So let's just go briefly over some uh, review of things that are, I'm sure, known to uh, to uh, a lot of you. In, in the bladder, there is a tumor that is basically the equivalent of lobular carcinoma or diffuse gastric cancer in the bladder with similar morphology. And as we're going to see with similar molecular background, uh, the names that have been used are plasmacytoid, signet ring, diffuse carcinoma. So it can happen, it's rare. Uh, the common features of this, it's this unique uh, tumor type that has uh, diffuse infiltration, single cells, um, with a rare or any stromal reaction. The cell morphology is unique also, but characterized by these eccentrically located nuclei with fair amount of cytoplasm, and giving it the appearance of a plasma cell. And despite all the excitement that some people get when they, did, when they do CD138 and it's positive and they think, oh, well, they're really similar to plasma cells, these cells, as you all know, they're not hematopoietic, they're not related, they're pure epithelial cells, they just happen to look like that. And the name has kind of been given, uh, the different names have been used, but the theme is the same. If you have predominance of these cells, the plasmacytoid looking cells, people have called it plasmacytoid. In some tumors, when signet ring cells predominated, the term signet ring cell carcinoma was used. Our experience and the experience of actually, even when you read the articles that use one specific term, they always mention that these two cell types al almost always coexist in the same tumor. But one of them might predominate, and this is why some people preferred a certain term over the other. Now the acceptable terms are plasmacytoid, signet ring, slash, uh, diffuse urothelial carcinoma. All of them convey the same. And of course, an important distinction is some true signet ring cells that are associated of a mucinous adenocarcinoma, which is another rare subtype of adenocarcinomas of the bladder. But this is a completely different type of tumor. Uh, clinically, these are, again, it's unique subtype. They're notorious for their aggressive behavior. They usually present that as a locally advanced disease. So even if sometimes you get a superficial biopsy and you think it looks like a T1 disease, many times by the time of a resection or a repeat biopsy, the tumors are usually more locally advanced. They have a higher rate of positive surgical margins in areas that surgeons sometimes may not even suspect, and I'm going to show you some examples. And they have a high recurrence rate, particularly peritoneal recurrence, peritoneal dissemination of the disease. Even after sometimes they show an initial response to chemotherapy, there is a high rate of, of recurrence in the peritoneal uh, cavity. And overall, they have very, uh, very poor prognosis as showing in these Kaplan-Meier curves. These are just one, one of two examples where this is a real case that was uh, presented to us in the closing section. And of course, this was one of those days where you wish you're not doing closing section you see how difficult this tumor would be to recognize as invasive carcinoma and closing section. But, but that was the attempted cystectomy for, for plasmacytoid carcinoma, and the surgeons did not expect to see diffused um, uh, infiltration of the abdomen, and, and a biopsy was done. And with this diagnosis, they aborted the cystectomy procedure. And this is the permanent section. Another scenario which we also have seen is they'll take uh, the parts of the ureter, and they will not be suspecting that there is tumor there. And if you look at the ureter, the luminal side of it is really benign reactive urethelium, but the bulk of the tumor is actually infiltrating at the soft tissue planes, at the periurethral soft tissue, and you end up having so positive surgical margins that were not really suspected. But of course, it goes without saying to this uh, audience that 
We've always recognized the similarity of these tumors in the bladder to the two main organs where these tumors are more common, lobular carcinoma of the breast and diffuse gastric cancer. And we also know that the underlying, uh, uh, actually a common genetic finding is mutations in CDH1, the gene that encodes e uh, as uh, especially in the breast, the, the result of that is loss of expression of e in, in tumor cells. Uh, some of similar findings were actually also reported in the bladder, but that was limited to the IHC, where most of these cases were, were negative for e -cadherin. So keeping, we ha having that in mind, we decided to study this, this subset of bladder cancer and see if we can identify some really underlying genetic mechanism for this disease. So we identified a total of 31 cases, 25 were retrospectively identified in our cohort, six tumors were identified prospectively from our uh, ongoing institutional effort to sequence solid tumors. Uh, six of these cases turned out to be plasma cytoid, and in six of the cases when we had enough tissue available, we did whole exome sequencing. Uh, MSK Impact is going to be talked about a little bit in the next or, uh, one of the presentations. Uh, Deborah is going to mention more about it, but it's a next-gen sequencing platform that we, we use now a lot in, uh, in this institution. So briefly to show you the results of the whole exome cases, uh, not surprisingly, and this is what we were, we were hoping for, which turned to be true, that all six cases had CDH1 truncating mutations in them, in addition to a number of other genes. Uh, and, and a typical uh, tumor suppressor gene scenario we had in one example here, uh, loss of heterozygosity, and another example that is here, you have cup neutral LOH where you have loss of the wild type allele and duplication of the mutant allele. Uh, so, um, but it was part of the same as all of these have truncating mutations in CDH1. When we combine all these cases, the one that underwent impact and uh, the whole exome, and uh, from the 31 cases, 26 uh, tumors have CDH1 mutations. The most of them were truncating mutations as shown by these black dots here. And as a typical, again, of a tumor suppressor gene, there were no hot spots as the mutations were present throughout, throughout the gene. And most of these tumors resulted in loss of expression of e -cadherin. And these are some of the examples that I show you here. This one happened to have a nice internal control where you have retained uh, e cadherin expression in the overlying normal urothelium. Uh, the only exception were two cases, one uh, in which the mutation was a missense mutation and there was some weak expression of the protein. Another example was a splice site mutation that I'm not showing here. But for the most part, the cases were negative for e cadherin. But then when we looked at the, the other genetic background of these tumors, and these are the genes that are commonly altered in urothelial carcinoma, they were pretty much similar. There were some exceptions in some genes with, that are not very common in bladder cancer in general, PIXPR1 and KDFM6A, but the unique thing that really stood out was the lack of CDH1 mutations almost universally in the tumors that are not plasma cytoid carcinoma uh, compared to like more, uh, the majority of them of the plasma cytoid had these truncating mutations. Of note here that there is a few cases that were in the TCGA that were shown to have CDH1 mutations. When we looked at them from the available digital slides, they did not look plasma cytoid, and the mutations were actually missense. None of them was a truncating mutation. Uh, two of them were our cases that we contributed to the TCGA. We get the tissue, we looked at it carefully, we stained uh, the ones that were here, and they all have diffuse expression of e And So we believe these were missense mutations are not really necessarily functional, and as a, and as a result, we didn't have change in the phenotype of these tumors. So summarizing our findings in this table, uh, as you can see, this is basically all what, what we show. There are three things that I want you to, um, I want you to pay attention to. As I said, 26 of the 31 cases had uh, mutations. Five of them were wild type by sequencing, but still had uh, loss of expression of e adherin by immunohistochemistry. There was another case where we were able to find two components of uh, one that is urothelial NOS and one that was plasma cytoid. We are going to show you some work that we did in that tumor. And when we had sections of tissue that contained non-invasive in situ carcinoma in addition to the invasive disease, we showed that there is uh, the, the non-invasive component retained membranous expression of e cadherin unlike the invasive tumor. I'm going to show you how that was going to help us in this case and also shed another uh, light on, on, the, on the, the biology of this tumor. So these are the cases that were wild type by sequencing, but uh, lost e cadherin expression by IHC, as you can see here, and we have nice internal control. So knowing that, that uh, promoter uh, methylation is another mechanism of inactivating 
uh, certain uh, some genes. We decided to look into that, and we did the typical bisulfite sequencing of the promoter region of weak adherin. And as you can see here, in four of the five samples, there was heavy methylation in the CPG islands of the promoter region. And these are represented here. The black uh, circles are, um, are the uh, sites of uh, methylated CPG islands. The empty ones are not. And you can see, compared to some of the matching uh, urothelial carcinoma and OS cases, the level of methylation was significantly higher in the plasma cytoid the cases so indicating that there, there, is a, there is a requirement for inactivation e, uh, CDH1 either by mutation or by methylation, uh, which basically explained 30 of the 31 cases. And this is the other example where uh, we found two distinct areas in, uh, of morphology in the same tumor. So if you look at urothelial carcinoma in general, there is a lot of heterogeneity in it. But this specific subtype, if you look at them, most of them actually show pure morphology. So most of the cases of plasma cytoid carcinoma will not have another component. And there is a handful of cases that we've identified. Uh, this one was the one available before we published this, this study, but we have a couple more now that we're studying as well. So what we decided to do, we did macro dissected the two different areas of the same tumor, and we submitted them both for sequencing. And as you can see, the two components share two mutations, one in CDK and one A, and one in pic 3 c 2 g clearly indicating that they have similar origin. But each component has its, has its own set of mutations that are also uh, pathogenic in their own. Uh, interestingly, where the CDH1 mutation was present only in the plasma cytoid component that was also negative for e adherent expression. <coughs> so we wanted to go further and see so do some, uh, some functional analysis of, of uh, these tumors. So we checked some cell lines that naturally have high levels of, of e adherent CDH1. We did CRISPR-Cas9 um, um, knockout of CDH1. As you can see, the results here, the, the knockouts do not have e adherent at all. And we did two uh, assays that are commonly used, the wound healing assay and poison chamber assay. And in both uh, assays, we, we found that the knockouts have faster or they have higher motility in, in, uh, in the wound healing assay and poison chamber. And that, we believe, would explain the unique behavior of these tumors by their high rate of local recurrence and peritoneal dissemination, which can explain the worse outcome that these tumors in general have. So I mentioned to you, and we all know, that the morphology is similar in plasma cytoid and uh, bladder and lobular carcinoma and diffuse gastric cancer, and we know they have CDH1 alterations in all, in all these three tumors, but are there other things that can help us ident distinguish one from the other? Uh, when we put the, some of the common, commonly altered genes in these three tumor types, there are some differences that, that showed up that can help us actually distinguish these tumors. Uh, first, uh, the type of mutations in bladder plasma cytoid carcinoma is, is mostly truncating mutations, as you can see here, which is the same with lobular carcinoma of the breast. Perhaps that explains why this, the e adherence stain is very helpful in these two uh, organs. Uh, but the co-mutation pattern is completely different from uh, between urothelial carcinoma and lobular carcinoma of the breast. In the stomach, again, it's, there is some overlap of the mutations, but the type of mutations, in the most, for the most part, are missense mutations, uh, which can also help identify some differences, and also the co-mutation pattern. So one thing that I mentioned to you, when we stained the uh, invasive and in situ carcinoma in the same tumor when, when it was available, uh, was that our urothelial carcinoma cyto always retained e adherent expression compared to the invasive disease. We know that's not the case in, in lobular carcinoma of the breast because we all have been in situations where we use that stain. We know it's lost in the lobular carcinoma cyto. So clearly e adherent in the bladder is something that, that uh, the mutation happens later when the tumor uh, becomes invasive. This is an example here uh, to show that this is a plasma cytoid carcinoma. This is urothelial carcinoma in cyto. Clearly, the, uh, the stain is absent in the invasive tumor, but it's retained in, uh, in the in situ component. And we have a couple of cases in which we didn't, not only did we do IHC, but we were able to sequence these tumors, and we did not see mutations in, in the in situ disease. So again, confirming that this alteration is really, uh, starts at some point when the tumor becomes invasive, not when, when the neoplastic process starts. So back to our case and see how some of this information was helpful. So uh, the tumor was deeply infiltrating. This is a section here showing the muscularis propia infiltration by the tumor. 
This is a more of a superficial section. You have the surface urethelium here, and you have this condensation in the submucosa, which is something we typically see. It's actually very common in plasma cytoid carcinoma of the bladder. You have this layer of condensation in, in, in the uh, submucosa. And then when we looked at the IHC expression uh, in the invasive and non-invasive tumor, uh, clearly we have retention of e coherent staining in the urethelial carcinoma in situ. So again, having an in situ component in a new organ will be a strong, strongly in favor of having another primary. But we've all seen cases of different tumor types where the metastasis can colonize a pre-existing surface. We've seen it all the time in bladder adenocarcinoma, for example. You can swear that what's happening there is a villus adenoma-like picture, but we know that these cases were metastasis. But then if we believe that in this case, for example, let's, if we argue, let's say these are the same cells that colonize the surface, you don't expect them to kind of regain e here and after they become in the surface. So having that, even at the morphologic IHC level, would be enough evidence that we are dealing with another primary in this scenario. But we went even further and we did, actually we sequenced both tumors from both locations and as you can see these are the genes that were mutated in each tumor. Uh, interestingly and not surprisingly actually that both tumors have mutations in CDH1 but they were completely different mutations, unrelated. Uh, the bladder tumor had a truncating mutation, the breast tumor had a splice site mutation, but then there's not a single mutation that was shared between the two tumors, clearly indicating that what happens here are two independent tumors with the same driver alteration happening independently in, the, in two different locations. So one last piece of the puzzle here that we, I wanted to talk about is we all know that there is a subset of patients with lobular carcinoma of the breast and diffuse gastric cancer that have germline alterations by CDH1. So we thought maybe we'll have to look into this and it took us some time to convince the IRB to allow us to look at the germline of these patients. And then we did, and we did not see a single case with CDH1 mut mutation in the germline. So that was before we get this particular case when we have two tumors. So I said, okay, well, there's an exception to every rule, and this is going to be the case where we're going to have the first germline alteration in CDH1. But it turned out to be not the case. So this tumor, this patient did not have germline alteration in CDH1, but still had two tumors that are dependent on CDH1 loss that were happening independently in, in two different locations. So our final diagnosis was actually plasma cytoid carcinoma of the bladder and then invasive lobular carcinoma. Now, she, the patient is doing well, surprisingly, uh, and unlike what most of uh, uh, advanced plasma cytoid carcinomas would do, uh, she, for her bad luck, she had, the tumor was not resectable because it was locally advanced. Because of the hydronephrosis that she had when in her presentation, she wasn't eligible for cisplatin based chemotherapy, which is the typical uh, treatment that one would give to your theater carcinoma. And as of like compassionate approach, they were, sh she got an exception to use PD-1, uh, anti-PD-1 uh, uh, treatment, which is the nivolumab, I believe. She tolerated the treatment very well, and she's, I think, she's now after the 10th or 11th dose, and she's having a stable disease more than a year following that diagnosis. So hopefully that will continue for her. So to summarize, uh, I hope that I could I convince you now that plasma cytoid carcinoma is one of those rare aggressive variants of bladder cancer uh, that usually arises in the same background of urethelial carcinoma but has a unique uh, molecular event or genetic event that is, that is the result of uh, somatic mutations or loss of function mutation in, in CDH1. That results in loss of e adherin and we believe that loss of e adherin is behind the biology and the aggressive nature and the type of recurrence that these tumors usually show unlike the other urethelial carcinomas. I showed you that there, so far, there hasn't been a case, a single case of a CDH1 germline association with plasma cytoid carcinoma. And it's important to keep uh, the differential diagnosis in mind. And when there's a question, there are some, some tools that we can rely on to help us make that distinction. Uh, just uh, acknowledging some of the uh, support that uh, was uh, was up behind the study, the, particularly the Translational Integrative Medicine Research Fund or the Burn Fund, that was, uh, that was the grant that actually I, I used to do most of the work, but also some other funding mechanism and also acknowledging the people who were very instrumental and helpful in, in having our uh, research done. And thank you, and I'm happy to take your questions. <laughs>